Ladies and gentlemen, athlete, activist, documentarian, writer, human being, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Ladies and gentlemen, what a great honor this is tonight. And uh, I want to start, Kareem, by acknowledging the fact that uh, you are not all of, just all of those things, which was considerable. You were also the recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And with that in mind, I will play for you that moment that President Obama bestowed upon you last year. Watch. Here's how great Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was. 1967, he had spent a year dominating college basketball. The NCAA bans the dunk. <laughs> they didn't say it was about Kareem, but it was about Kareem. <laughs> when a sport changes its rules to make it harder just for you, you are really good. And you look at that, him trying, you trying to stoop. With all the emotions running through you, having Coach Wooden pass, your parents are gone, you endured leukemia. I wonder what the emotions were like for that moment. It may have been not just the greatest moment, but a, a moment where you reflect on your life and all the great accomplishments. What was that like for you? Well, for me, it was uh, a time to uh, appreciate my life and you know what I've been able to be involved in uh, just all the good things that have happened my kids uh, uh, the uh, things that have happened with me being able to reach out to people uh, through my writing and everything I got a novel written oh my goodness so and, you know, and another book coming out by the way in January uh, yet yeah. another one third this year yeah yeah it, they kind of backed up on me <laughs> But, uh, you know, it just uh, it's so fortunate to uh, ha have had that experience and been able to, to reach out to people and, and connect. Deborah Mor Morales, who's been with you for more than two decades, who's in our audience tonight. Nice hand, by the way, for Deborah. She helped make this evening happen. She said a very, point she said a very poignant thing after the, the afternoon was over and you were walking back, and she said to you, you felt him, didn't you? And, of course, as we mentioned, your parents are gone. Al and Cora, who I knew, but him was Coach Wooden. Can you reflect on what John would have thought seeing that for you, and also in all the, the changes in your lives together, which you wrote about so eloquently in your brand new book, as we take a look at Coach Wooden and you down through the years, what that void was like to not be able to see him see that for you? Um, I, I don't think that I could ever be sad about that because of all the time I got to spend with him. Right. You know, I, I was able to take advantage of those moments and uh, even toward the end of his life, you know, be there and be close and uh, continue to learn from him and continue to grow with him. You know, it was, uh, it was an incredible experience. Folks, if you have not picked up this book, by the way, Coach Wooden and Me, you must. It will blow you away, the emotion in this book. And there is one towards the end of the book, very moving passage you wrote uh, about Coach Wooden, and we see these pictures here. And, and, I, and I remember the quote because it really struck me as the definition of the book. First of all, you felt that he was a father figure to you at the very end. He touched you in ways as much as your father did. But there, you saw this man at the very end of his life, in his 90s, didn't have a whole lot of time left, and as you look at these pictures here, um, you wrote something about his sense of equanimity, sense of justice, sense of fairness, even as far back as when you played college basketball, and this is towards the very end of his life, Coach Wooden. 
Um, I'm going to, the quote's going to come up. There's that final shot, which is so touching, so beautiful. I think, Debbie, did you take this picture too? You did. Uh, here's the quote. I looked at this shrunken 98-year-old man with thick glasses and large jug ears and felt a tenderness for him that I had taken for granted. I had modeled myself after him in so many ways, and I was still learning how, to, how deep his influence ran. I realized in all my writings about black history and politics and pop culture, they had one theme, making the playing field even so everyone had the same opportunity. Or as Coach might say, no one else eats unless we all eat. Very powerful. Let's talk a little bit about his sense of justice well, uh, you would have to go back uh, in time, you know, to just to how he was raised. You know, his dad uh, was a very strong influence on him, uh, morality-wise, uh, encouraged him to read and uh, absorb the knowledge, uh, the wisdom of the ages, and uh, to read the classics and everything. So uh, just the whole value of education was uh, a key to uh, self-fulfillment and uh, self-development. Mm -hmm. And um, that was something that uh, was a tradition in my family. Uh, same thing, you know, uh, education being the way that you advance and uh, make things better for yourself and your family. I remember him saying, what I was most impressed with you when I recruited you were your grades. Were yeah. you, do you really, I believe that you really meant that, by the way. No, oh, no, he did. I, of course, you know, I, I'm on my, uh, my recruiting trip to UCLA. I'm still a senior in high school. I don't know how little you were, but you were a Okay. And it was, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to go to UCLA to play basketball. I figured we would talk a little bit about basketball, especially out of the gate. <laughs> no. <laughs> we started, he started talking to me about academics. He said, uh, you'll, you'll probably do very well at school here because I, I see your grades. You, haven't had any problems. You're a pretty good student. Uh, that's great because I want all of our guys to graduate. And mm -hmm. he, he went right past basketball. Mm. Uh, wow. I thought there was a great quote in the book, too, when you said, I'd like to go on a time machine, talk about yourself, go back in time and kick my younger self's ass. What did you mean by that? Just some of the, the stupid things that I did uh, as a young person. Uh, not being able to control or understand my emotions. And you, you, you do dumb things uh, when you're in that position. And you know, I, I, I had my share. <laughs> <laughs> you know, John and, and Nell Wooden were inseparable. When she died, I don't think he ever really recovered from the heartbreak, even though he was able to press on. Would you agree that he was a Someone holding that vigil for Nell for his whole life. And we have members of Coach's family here tonight. Would you agree that that was an emotion that he never was able to rid himself of, the, oh, the he, grieving? He, he was just waiting for when he could reconnect with her. Mm. And, you know, he had to wait till he passed on, but um, that, that was how he saw it. He, he, didn't, um, he didn't feel sorry for himself, but he, he didn't like being alone. It, it bothered him. Mm. I'm going to talk about a controversial word um, that people have talked about recently in the last few w years, particularly in terms of social impact, and it's in the ugliest word, or among the ugliest words in the language. It's the N-word. Your high school coach, Jack Donahoe, Donahue, trying to motivate you, used the N-word, and it really deeply offended you and affected you and hurt you, but yet you were able to forgive him of that. Yeah, I mean, talk about it, that for a moment. Um, just understanding human nature, and um, he he offended me in an attempt to try to motivate me. You know, he wasn't trying to pull me down. He was trying to motivate me in in a positive direction, and he he got emotional and made a mistake. Jeez, <laughs> happens to other people too. You know, so at, at a certain point. Uh, Coach Wooden got through to me that uh, we all go through this, pro this process in our lives and we have to uh, learn to forgive others and forgive ourselves and uh, try to do it better the next time. That's all we can do. Mm. I want to talk about the, the basketball part of your life for a moment in, in represented by one particular motion, that is the skyhook. 
I always thought it was the most beautiful shot in the history of college basketball and pro basketball. And yet, you had practiced that shot since the fifth grade? Is that true? Yeah, by myself. <laughs> Mr. Kelly, the uh, custodian at my grade school, gave me the key to get into where the gym was so I could get in there at night in the winter and work on the uh, George Mikan drill. Hmm. That was uh, the drill. And uh, I just found out last year that the guy that showed me that drill lives down in Carlsbad right now. Wow, yeah. really? Right, and found out also his son went to UCLA and played soccer. Ah, yeah. That's wild. Yep. Do you think it was a representation of freedom? I mean, I don't mean to be overly artistically dramatic about it, but there's there something freeing about that shot? Because you were so dominant with it, no one could stop it. Well, you know, the, there were guys out there that thought that they could beat me up, you know, and just using movement and knowing my way around the court, I, I could, you know, I always felt like Wile E. Coyote, you know. I, <laughs> or, or, you know, uh, you know, Popeye dealing with Bluto, you know, because that's, that's, Rick Mahorn looks, even looked like Bluto, right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it was, that's, that's what it was for me. I want to show the folks, to me, one of the greatest moments in your career. Well, no, I'm going to back up. Maybe not the greatest moment in your career, but one of the greatest moments in Laker history because it was the inaugural game with Irvin Magic Johnson. It was in San Diego, and it was a buzzer beater. Let's listen to it, and then we'll talk about it. Watch. Ford's got time. Spencer Haywood is out there. Nixon, Magic Johnson, and Kareem. Ford sends it to Kareem. Sky hook up in. Good. Lakers win. Score it. Kareem up. Bill Jabbar has given the Los Angeles Lakers a victory. And Magic Johnson is out there celebrating like they just won the NCAA championship. Rob Lodhoney is out there. We've got Magic Man and Kareem Abdul Jabbar. Abdul Jabbar just threw it. Now, tell, me what, tell the folks what, what Magic said to you and what you said back to Magic. Uh, I, I couldn't hear him with all the noise and everything, and he was, like, screaming <laughs> in my ear. I, I couldn't make any sense out of it. But uh, we, we got in the locker room. I, I told him, I said, look, uh, you know, Irvin, if we go through this emotionally, we're going to be wiped out before Thanksgiving. You know? <laughs> it's the first game of, th of, the, of the season. But, you know, it, it was a good moment because... Uh, through my dealings with him, uh, it, that exemplifies his ability to enjoy the moment. And, you know, that's when that changed for me. You know, I was with somebody who uh, actually could, could have fun doing this, it was, and it was fun. It got to be a lot of fun when we started winning when Magic came. Uh, Coop and, and James can, can back me up on that, you know, because he, he, he made it a lot easier to, to smile in the morning. You never knew what he was going to do. Uh, <laughs> you, you hear this music coming. Uh, what was it? Uh, Atomic Dog. George Clinton, right? You could hear him coming, and then here we go. But we had a wonderful, we had a wonderful little run there. It was a lot of fun. I once asked Irvin, the very beginning of his career, if he would ever be able to be married to anybody. This was before he was married to Cookie, and he said, I'm already married, I'm married to the game. He says, every day I look at myself and I say, damn, damn, I'm here. My question to you, in, as humble as you are, as soft-spoken as you are, are there times somewhere in a quiet corner of your life you went, damn, I'm the best scorer of all time, I'm a six-time MVP, I am five, five what, how many titles you won, Damn, I must really have been good. I, I, you know what happened when I finally was able to, to beat Wilt's record? I, you know, I never ever in my life thought I could do that. I, I used to see him when I was still in grade school. Mm -hmm. And you know, I looked like a twig being compared to a steel beam, you know, me compared to <laughs> Wilt. You know, that, that, that couldn't possibly happen. You know? So for that to happen the way it did, it really made me feel good. Especially, you know, when the rivalry started to, to get kind of intense there for a moment, you know. So, uh, yeah, it, it, that, that was a lot of fun. And it was special to me because I had known Wilt for so long. And um, while I was in high school, you know, got to see him and hang out with him. 
I got to eyeball his girlfriend and all those kinds of things. <laughs> yeah. But you talk about fun. For the first time in the early 80s, I want to say 79, 80, we saw a fun side of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and it was in a movie called Aeroplane. Watch. Climbing to cruise at 42,000. We'll report again over Lincoln. Over and out. Wait a minute. I know you. You're Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. You play basketball for the Los Angeles Lakers. I'm sorry, son, but you must have me confused with someone else. My name is Roger Murdoch. I'm the co-pilot. You are Kareem. I've seen you play. My dad's got season tickets. I think you should go back to your seat now, Joey. Right, Clarence? Oh, he's not bothering anyone. Let him stay here. <laughs> All right, but just remember, my name is Roger Murdoch. I'm an airline pilot. I think you're the greatest, but my dad says you don't work hard enough on defense. And he says that lots of times you don't even run down court. And that you don't really try, except during the playoffs. The hell I don't. Listen to you. I've been hearing that crap ever since I was at UCLA. I'm out there busting my buns every night. Tell your old man to drag Walton and Lanier up and down the court for 48 minutes. Do you, this is a point of question, do you feel that that scene changed a lot of people's perception of you, you and your sense of humor? Yeah, it did. It, it, and it helped you know, me laugh at myself and helped let other people laugh at me and could see that I got the joke. And, you know, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't that I didn't get it. I, I was being blamed that the Lakers couldn't win. And once that changed, uh, you know, I, I could smile. <laughs> it was as simple as that. We talked for a second or two about Wilt, but I want to come back to it for a second. You knew this guy since you were a teenager. You shared his, he gave you his clothes literally off his back. Yeah, he did. Then they were sweaty. Yeah, they were. He didn't wash them. Well, you know, it, it's like they, they were the suits that he went out and discoed in and got all sweaty and then didn't send them to the dry cleaners in time. <laughs> so he gave them to me, you know, like, here, kid. And, you know, I was in high school. But, you know, Wilt outweighed me by about 130 pounds. It, it wasn't like I was going to be able to wear them or anything. <laughs> Did you keep any of them just for safe, keep, keepsake? I wanted to, but, but Mom said, look, you know, we're not going to let these things take over the closet. Because <laughs> they would have, you know, and we threw them away. But uh, Wilt, Wilt was a nice guy. I, I just, we, it's not like we would have spent a lot of time hanging out or, but you didn't hate court. him, and he didn't hate no, you. No, not, not at all. Yeah. I, I had a lot of respect for him. He, he was an incredible athlete. I remember uh, when he was in college, I was first aware of him. And he also, Wilt competed uh, for the University of Kansas in the shot put, the quarter mile, and the high jump. Unbelievable. You know? And I thought, well, who is this guy? It must be Superman. You know? I told you that story at dinner tonight. The first time I met Wilt Chamberlain, he was in a $250,000 white Rolls Royce convertible, two giant Great Dane dogs in the back seat, beautiful blonde woman packed into a front in her dress in the front seat. He's wearing a purple, this is true, a silver and purple silk jumpsuit. He's 7'2 at the time, 330 or 40 pounds. I went, Wilt, I'd love to have you on the show. And he said, Roy, I would love to come on your show, but you have to understand I'm trying to keep a low profile. <laughs> Quick thoughts on some of the people that mattered the most to you throughout your life. Start with Bill Russell. Uh, I thought that Bill was a, a great role model for uh, young kids uh, that were trying to have something to say and didn't know how to say it because uh, he always conducted himself uh, with dignity and uh, uh, intelligence and he wanted uh, other people to understand that that's where he was coming from. And it really helped me understand how to be an activist. Uh, you couldn't be an angry person. You had to be a person with an issue that was righteous. And it, it, I, got, I got that from Bill. Uh, Bill and Jackie Robinson, really, you know, and they were both civil rights activists their mm -hmm. whole lives. Well, so, we'll talk about Jackie in just a second, but yeah. uh, I want to talk about Ali first. 
you met him at a very young age. You were still in college, I believe. Right. And there are some fabulous photos of the two of you. You're playing the drums here with him. I, I guess he's playing a guitar with you. How did That's he? That's total fake, you know. <laughs> How did he impact your life, Muhammad Ali? Um, I think Muhammad Ali was great because he, he showed us um, how to speak up for the, for the common man. You know, he was going to have it easy, but he, he made statements for all black Americans, tough statements, you know, things that got him criticized and caused him to, to lose income. But mm -hmm. he had to say it, you know, and... We all stood for him at that point because of the way that he had stood for all black Americans. And, you know, we loved him for that. He, he didn't have to do, I didn't have to know him to understand that and, and want to be there for him as he dealt with, uh, you know, the federal government was coming down on him. I, like all those other athletes there, I wanted to do what I could do to help him because he, mm -hmm. he, he, he was a righteous guy. And John Wooden at first didn't like the fact that you were associated with a man who changed his name, Cassius right. Clay, to Muhammad Ali. Kind of mocked you even a little bit for knowing him at first. Right, at first and then yeah. he came around, didn't he, Coach? Yeah, when he began to understand the real nature of the Vietnamese War and uh, how it uh, affected the poor people of this country unjustly. And um, he, he got it. You know, Co Coach Wooden was willing to... Uh, adapt his thinking when new information came in that, uh, that made him take notice. Mm -hmm. Some quick thoughts. Let's start with Bill Walton, a guy that is, you'll always be linked to. You guys became pretty close friends towards the end of your lives, you know, towards after your playing days were over, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. And uh, when we were playing against each other, you know, it was very competitive. And uh, for about two or three years after he retired, we didn't talk. And then we realized, you know, what is this all about? You know, I got nothing but respect for you. And uh, it just went by the wayside. He's a real character, too. He's an original, is he not? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, you're not kidding about that. I tell everybody he reminds me of Goofy. <laughs> Jackie Robinson wrote a letter to you as yeah. a kid. You wrote him first, I assume. <laughs> but how did that letter affect your life? Uh, Jack was an incredible uh, uh, effect on my life, um, and it, it was weird the way he kept coming back into it. When I was a little boy, I was a Dodger fan. Due to my mom was a big Negro Leagues fan, so mm -hmm. you know Jackie Robinson's playing for the Dodgers, and my mom new to New York, Jackie Robinson. Oh my goodness! So uh, you know I grew up as a Dodger fan, and I, I have been my whole life, and then. Um, his uh, association with UCLA. Right. And that, that was one of the reasons I went to UCLA. Mm. Um, I've written, uh, since I've retired, about the 761st Tank Battalion, which is, happens to be the unit that Jackie was in during World War II, was the Tank Battalion. Wow. They, they uh, fought for Patton, and they liberated at least three of the Nazi death camps, including Dachau. Mm. Uh, and there was Jackie again, you know. He wasn't able to participate because uh, he had to deal with his court-martial down right. in, in Texas. But he would have been with them uh, when they did that. It's just, it's just amazing. Bruce Lee, how did he infect your life? Uh, great guy. Um, Look at that picture. That's a classic. What was I, the name of that? Something of Death? What was it? Wings of Death or something? Game of, game of Death. Game of Death. Bruce and I, Bruce liked to... Uh, spar with me because he, he said it was like fighting an octopus. My arms were too long. <laughs> it's impossible for him to get in and hit me, but it, it was good problems for him to solve. And he could solve those problems. I'm, I'm glad he wasn't angry at me when we did that. But uh, that's on the set uh, of the movie over in Hong Kong. How did Magic Johnson, who was certainly in terms of approach, we talked about it very briefly at the top, Approach to game and life, it's not your style, Kareem, let's face it. He's, he's, he's more of an ebullient guy and you're more of a respect, you know, respectful and dignified but thoughtful and quiet and shy, and he is not. But how did he bring you out in life? Well, you know, he, he made it okay to, to enjoy things and express yourself and uh, let people know how you feel. And uh, I, that, that wasn't my first inclination. You know, I was 
as you just mentioned, the, had a different type of personality. But he made it okay to smell the roses. And, and you know, it, it was fun for that reason. Jerry West, you played with him and you played against him and then he, you played for him uh, when he was your coach. He had some very interesting things to say to me when I spoke to him this week. He said, I never played with a black player in college basketball alongside of me on my, high, on my college teams. And I learned a lot through Kareem and I consider him a very close friend of mine now. I, I've known Jerry since I was 14 years old. Wow. It, and it was his rookie year in the NBA and the NBA teams used to practice at my high school gym. And I was standing in the gym, I'm in the ninth grade and Jerry just walked up beside me and started talking to me. And uh, you know, that was in the autumn of 1961. Wow, that's one year into the NBA. He was, that's, he was, the first year was six, first 1960. Year, yeah. Yeah. Wow, another Jerry, Jerry Buss, the late, great Jerry Buss. Well, Dr. Buss was a, a great guy in that he, he didn't think that he knew too much. Yeah. You know, he, d despite all his money and opportunities that he had, he didn't think he knew everything. And he let uh, Bill Sharman and Jerry and Pete Newell run the team. Uh, he sat in on the decisions, but he let the basketball minds, you know, think things out, and he helped with the other things. I mean, he really uh, was a team player working with the management, and it made it a easy for us to, to win. They listened, uh, we got that young man there that they call Big Game James. Uh, <laughs> You know, we could have chosen uh, some other guys like Dominique Wilkins or, or Terry Cummings that were going to have good careers. Jerry always picked the, the right guy for our team. I mean, he, he was wonderful. Mm. Uh, and, you know, Jerry Buss gave them the support. So, uh, you know, I, I, it was great working for them. I, I was so fortunate, uh, you know, the people that I played for in Milwaukee and the people that I played for here in Los Angeles were, were good people in the front office and they were able to get things done. Last two questions. You have battled leukemia. You are healthy, thank God. Uh, you are going to be able to deal with it, thank God. But it's still in your body. And as I said before at the top, you lost some people that you love very closely. Um, life is, is really, at times, very difficult and very challenging. How did, through sports, you somehow address these things, mortality and, and the like, to become a better person with adversity? Well, I think just having to be there for other people and uh, when you're having a tough time accepting their help when they need to be there for you, that, that's uh, one of the joys of life. Uh, you know, just the people that you get to work with and the people that you get to share friendship and thoughts with. That's, those are very special moments, and we have to learn to appreciate those. You know, and when we do that, that, that is the joy of, of, of life. You know? well, what would be a stereotype that people have of you that you wish people would get, get rid of? Oh, that I, that I don't like people or to, to talk to people. You know, it's just I was so, uh, you know, with the blinders on when I was playing. And shy, inherently shy, too. Yeah. Yeah, but that, that was, uh, you know, just me looking at everything from my tall perch, you know. <laughs> <laughs> last, last question, and we're almost out of time. This country is very divided right now. I have people tell me tonight, please don't make this political, and it's hard to because you're an activist and you've always stood up. I, I, I want to see if I can ask it this way, though. With all of the division, besides the obvious, what can we do as a people to come closer, to bring it all together again, to come together is not just in taking a knee like Colin Kaepernick did, and I think we have a shot of it, but in, in something substantial, more than just a symbol, how can we come together again as a country? That, that's really easy, Roy. You know, now that the, uh, the consciousness has been raised and people want to, well, yeah, what is this all about? It, it's about talking to your fellow Americans no matter uh, what they look like or what their ethnic background or religious background or socioeconomic background is, talk to your fellow Americans, realize that uh, who they are and what their good qualities might be and um, we can discuss the problems that we have to solve. 
But until we start talking to each other about it, nothing's going to happen. And um, for those of you who haven't noticed uh, over the past 150 years, this is the greatest country in the world. We can solve any problem. And we will. Last point. It's, it's a great honor to have you here tonight. I really, truly mean it. And thank you for, for coming up here and, and helping raise all kinds of great numbers tonight for these kids. Your legacy, what would you most want people to say about you at the end of the day, at the end of the life, at the end of the career, about Kareem Abdul-Jabbar? Well, I, I hope that they would say that, uh, you know, as uh, one of Coach Wooden's products, um, I, I did my share. Um, that's all any of us can do, and uh, it's been great and fun doing my share. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Thank you. Thank you. We want to bring up the kids and acknowledge them. Let's bring them on up. And we're going to give you this award, one of many. As Billy Crystal said, it may not be the Presidential Medal of Freedom, but it's the Roy Firestone Award for all your service to your community. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, everyone. <laughs>